Hey, welcome back to the uh, the Aerospace Executive Podcast. Uh, it is early November, and I am uh, absolutely thrilled to have once again uh, Andy Mansell on with me. Andy is a uh, just an expert in the uh, the commercial aircraft leasing arena. Uh, he is uh, a principal at Split Rock Aviation and brings about a thirty year background in uh, aircraft leasing, trading, sales. Um, and he's just an all around good guy. So, uh, thrilled to have you back, Andy. What's happening in Wisconsin today? Uh, well, thanks for the intro, Craig. And it's great to, great to be back. Uh, surprisingly here, I can report that we're about to have a burst of warm weather. We'll be in the sixties, maybe even the seventies. Good for you. In Wisconsin too, huh? November. Yeah. Global warming. <laughs> Who knew? Did snow in October then? It, it, it did it. Yeah, that's right. I did hear it snowed up there. Yeah. So we got some sun, we got some sunshine out today. So uh, well, gonna, you have I'm, sunshine I'm, every day. I'm going I'm to play the hooky a little bit early, <laughs> but uh, we'll see what happens. So, hey, lots of lots of interesting stuff happening in our arena. You know, the leasing side of the house, interest rates. We yep. got engine issues out there. You have growing pains on on engines and and lots of exciting stuff. And I know that every lever that you know, yeah, a lot of levers being pulled to meet the market demand. So let's let's just talk about that a little bit. No, there's a lot of pressure points for for Sean. Let's talk. Let's just start with the with the 800 pound gorilla leasing rates, interest <laughs> rates, leasing rates. What's happening? How is it affecting you know the the immediate and what's what's the downstream looking like? So let's start on the narrow body side and with new aircraft. Um, I have a little bit of a bone to pick with some of the commentary in the market because I don't think it accurately reflects the status of all lessors. There's been no shortage of talk of um, lease rentals um, have not kept up with the uh, increase in interest rates. But that's too broad a statement to be accurate uh, for, for, for me. If you're a lessor taking delivery of new aircraft, you are making hay at the moment because standard a standard lease has the lease rental is adjusted immediately prior to delivery to reflect the currently prevailing interest rates. Yet your weighted average cost of capital trails that interest rate by a bunch. So your rule of thumb on a narrow body aircraft, every 1% interest rates go up, your lease rental is going to increase by about 30,000 a month. So you can take that pickup and yet you're not rolling over 100% of your debt in one hit. So if you're a lessor with new aircraft out there, you benefit in a, in a rising uh, interest rate market. It's actually the inverse that's true. If interest rates fall at the same pace as they rise, then that is your challenge as a lessor because the lessee is getting the benefit of the prevailing interest rate while your weighted average cost of capital is going to take a lot longer to, to come on down. So I, I, that's my view on the on the interest rate side. There is a such a shortage now of aircraft um, that lessors are, I think, generally pretty happy with, with where things are at. Um, you're talking about lessees extending um, or asking for lease extensions on aircraft that are more than 20 years old. And uh, there, there's a, a wonderful chart from, from Boeing that's out there that um, shows it in one hit, you know, what the issue is, is that during COVID, uh, the market missed delivery of about 2,500 to 3,000 aircraft. So mm -hmm. if you return to your uh, pre-pandemic um, growth and trajectory, those aircraft can't be magic, magic up. It'll take years to get those back in the market. And then when you add to that the uh, supply chain woes and, and um, other issues such as engines, um, those are all pressure points that have lessees just scrambling to retain the aircraft they have. Yeah, I was just at, I was just at uh, the Corporate Jet Investor Conference and sat on a panel about talking about, moderated panel talking about the supply chain. And how Boeing and Airbus, GE and Pratt are very limited. You know, basically the amount of aircraft that can be produced is very limited right now by the supply chain. It's sort of a tail wagging the dog scenario. Yeah, and and think about it too. The there was immense supply supply chain pressure before COVID hit. 
And these uh, these suppliers, you know, a, a lot of them, well, although well established, they are not really financially resilient enough to be put through these whipsaws, you know, that the OEMs treat them to, like ramp up, ramp down, ramp up, ramp down. So you can't really blame the suppliers, you know, if they focus more on what they believe their core market is and, you know, they don't want to overexpose themselves. What, what, what you mean partnership for success was was neither? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, of course, on the on the Boeing front, Having finally sh- shown signs of getting their shop in order, you know the problem just transfers to spirit. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I, I personally, yeah, no, no, no. Look, I, you, you know, we, we were talking about spirit the other day, and I don't want to look. I don't want to. Yeah, I'm not going to bash anybody, but it boggles my mind how a company that's been making the same fuselage for 50 years is having difficulties making that fuselage. Yeah, well, same, um, same company, different workforce, right? They lost a lot of the experience, folk. That's exactly a bingo. And that's exactly what somebody said was it's all about, you know, once again, one more issue we all need to talk about is workforce development and skills. But, um, I mean, I know that's definitely added to Boeing's woes on the supply yeah. chain. Well, and, and as we know in our, in our industry, uh, there's no such thing as an overnight fix. I mean, you can you can implement an overnight change, but it takes a long time for all of that to to flow through. And having pushed a lot of experience out the door, to use the term again, you can't just magic it back up. Hmm. And that's the whole thing. You know, talk about skilled trades, skilled CNC, you know, machinists that you know understand how to you know. How to assemble, you know, uh, you know, uh, complex machines. It's a tough, it's a tough deal. Yeah. Um, you know, it uh it is what it is. Yeah, Spirit said, do you think Spirit is now a takeover candidate? Stock dropped to yes. 15. Tom yeah. Gentile got, you know, you know, resigned, exited, new CEO search underway. Do you yeah. think Boeing takes it back, or do you think Carlisle or somebody else, private equity? Sucks it back into the I think it would be smart for Boeing to take it back. In some respects, you know, Boeing's a bit like old Mar Bell. You know, you 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 break everything up and push it out, and then you buy it all back and reassemble it, and then you break it back up and push it back out. Um, I think the idea of having your risk share partners, you know, which was a, a Boeing instigated thing many years ago, I would say they could look back and at Best the report card would be neutral, right? I mean, it hasn't worked out great, uh, you know, pushing everything out out of the house. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. So go, yeah, so go back. You know, world economy is a little bit in state of flux right now. We, we, you know, Ukraine, a lot of airplanes, you know, a lot of airplanes came out of service with uh, with Russia. Yeah. Or, um, you've got you know, Middle East turmoil now. Um, you know, world financial. You know, China is China suffering a little bit uh, from deflationary pressure. How will all this affect the new aircraft market? In your opinion, heck of a question. Uh, when you when you put all of the pressure points in, you know the the focus was initially on interest rates. Yep. Has since moved on to the M two money supply. A lot of economists. Focus on um, the fragility of the economy when you have a, a, a the size reduction we have in the M2 um, supply. Then you have the supply chain issues we've talked about, the lack of delivery of new aircraft, so that's leading to demand. I sort of boil it all the, all the way down to at some point, um, when you look at the three big pressure points that airlines are, are feeling, which is interest rates, um, fuel and again we haven't heard this for a long time labor costs are now a big one again oh, yeah. um you would think that the the via yield management this is going to force at some point a drop off in, in um, consumer demand like people just not wanting to pay up to fly you've already seen it uh, in the week q4 bookings you know in the us interestingly it has not shown up in europe Mm-hmm. I mean, Europe's doing great from a airline-specific um, point of view. So it's 
to to take your point, you look around the world, and it's not an uh, an even or equal application everywhere. China looks to be in trouble. You know, when when you look at their economy there, to the extent they're reporting on it, as uh, every time something negative happens, they just remove the statistic, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, China travel was a big engine in in um, Asia. Yeah. So you know, I think that looks it looks fragile there as as well. So, but ultimately, I mean, I, I think the drop off in demand or the or the weak Q four that um, data that you see in the the US is going to extend into twenty twenty four, and I think it will um, bleed um, outside of the uh, North America. Yeah, well, the, yeah, it's 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 really funny on the the labor costs. You know, it's a little bit of a good with regards to pilots in the U.S. It's a good news, bad news story. Uh, the good news is with FedEx and UPS announcements, you know, we've got too many pilots, minimum guarantees. Um, you know, PSA can you know now get pilots. That's the good news. They can get them. The bad news is it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars signing bonus. <laughs> And for a little regional carrier, that's not a insignificant sum. And they're paying, I think, I I, I want to say 175000 of that was all up front. Yeah. And then the rest was at the end of year one or two. Like, wow, that's a huge cash hit, plus training. Yeah. Well, and especially if you're, if, if as part of the deal, you know, you're advancing seniority because you can't take that back. Um, yeah. Um, I do wonder, you know, there's obviously been a bit of a shakeup at ATSG as well, which I think is reflective of um, what the freight industry is like at the at the moment. So I wonder if if a surplus of pilots on the on the cargo side um, helps ease the pressure uh, on the commercial pack side. I think, look, I think it will. I mean, you know, cargo across the board is down. I mean, you think about it, just just shipping in general, Maersk, horrible earnings, you know, FedEx, UPS, pilots, you know, you know uh, uh, Amerijet, I think is, uh, I, I've heard through the grapevine, Amerijet is, you've know, got a little too much capacity. Yeah. Um, you know, Amazon, the same thing. Yeah. So, you know, freight's down, trucking, you know, you know, rail is down a little bit too. So ultimately... Yeah, you know, it's just a rebalance. I think it's a rebalancing. And, yeah, yeah. The, you know, the the you know. ATSG just lost their CEO over it, um, and has announced they're going to pump the brakes on seven six conversions. Yeah, I, I think the I think the freighter market, the conversion market, is a you know you could just see what was going into into MRO and the big backlog. You're like, wow, who's gonna who's gonna absorb all this stuff? Um, and indeed, you know, we we spend a lot of time in the in the freighter space um, analyzing the the market. On the wide body side, there is a sort of a defined market, uh, a defined logical market for retirement of planes like DC tens and seven four sevens. And then you have the lack of um, quality feedstock left on the seven six front. Um, on the narrow body side. You know the main market for narrowbody freighters is Europe, which is you know um, feedstock for the when the big planes come in, uh, and there hasn't been much of an emerging market elsewhere where you could say, look, e- e-commerce has fundamentally changed the shape of our market. Therefore, Asia needs two hundred narrowbody freighters, or North America needs two hundred freighters, and yet there are a lot of seven three seven eight hundred. Um, conversions uh, in the pipeline, um, and I really don't see where all of those will be going. Not only the uh, not only the seven three seven eight hundreds, but now you're seeing a lot of a three twenty ones, a three twenties, three twenty ones. You know, company C cubed aerospace has got their STC. They put a buttload of money into their STC to convert a three twenties and three twenty ones. And, and those, think about that for for a moment, Craig, because that's a really tough market. Because not that they that the planes won't won't be credible freighters, but existing freighter operators are not. You know, you have to convert people to to yep. sell to sell those, um, or you have to be an an operator who thinks there's you know an opportunity in that freight market to to also do something, mm-hmm. and that 
historically as a business plan um, tends to be financially stressful. Cargo market is just very, it's, it's cyclical. It's frightening for a lot of people. I mean, it's, you know, it just, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not an easy place to make money. No. I mean, that's just the, you know, you know, when you think about all the dynamics that go into it, pilot costs, fuel costs, insurance costs, cost of conversion, the lack of MRO availability in the United States right now. Um, it's just a very, you know, uh, it's a challenging it look it's 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 just a, it's not for the faint of heart that's all i could say there it's just not for the faint of heart um you know apollo just bought atlas and you know if they'd waited a few months would they gotten a better price let's put it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah they're, no, they're, they'd probably like to take the mulligan on that one right? yeah you know that's the deal is it is it all looked really really good yeah 12 months ago when they started doing the uh, due diligence on it but yeah if they'd waited a few months and just you know had some patience with you know, would they be coming to the same conclusion? I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not in that deal. And I, yeah, you know, I'm not looking at the IR, you know, I'm not looking at the books or the IRR or anything like that. But I just wonder. Um, you know, it's it's uh yeah. it just shows you a little bit of the it, it just shows you a, a little bit of the dynamics in the industry though. Yeah. So what, things are what else? Out. What else is, is really interesting out there to me, Greg, is that you look at the general market sentiment, which is uh, like you might not be, get to call it a recession or it's going to be a, you know, there's there's a lot of the R word talk out there of how does the economy land. Um, you know, airlines talk, uh, you know, supply chain issues, you know, interest rates, fuel, et cetera. And yet Airbus, Airbus and Boeing have um, huge backlogs. So from their perspective, if you consider this 20 years ago, if you had, if you as a manufacturer had a two and a half to three year backlog, you'd say that your backlog was full. Yep. And now today, if you wanted a narrow body aircraft, certainly A320, you're probably looking at 2030 or beyond. Yep. So if you use if you use a historical measure as your guide, even if it gets pretty tough out there. The OEMs could probably half their backlogs, and it wouldn't change their production for the next few years. Good point. I mean, it's it's a very good point. I mean, yeah, what, yeah. Look, the the game. You know, you you, you got a you got a pure oligopoly. You either get a Max, or you get an A three twenty or three twenty one. You know, you either get a Leap one A or one B engine, or you yeah, have the Pratt geared turbofan. Your choices are limited. Um, and now your question, your choices are now limited to, do I stick to the 737-800 or the A320, you know, you know, CEO, classic engine option, and run it as long as I can? Um, yeah. Or do I just put to buy, you know, do I just look out to, you know, next seven years and say, all right, I'll put some deposits down and speculate on some airplanes and yeah. just see, you know, see where we go, at least get it in the queue, right? Yeah, I mean, the yes, they, and certainly enough people have done that. It's a tough one because um, time is not your friend, and escalation is never kind on a deal. And we're going to be in a, you know, obviously we're in a higher inflationary environment. So what that price looks like in in seven years, <laughs> I can tell you, I would not be not be banking the the order, and even keeping kit. Uh, I was talking to. Uh, someone in the industry the other day, and they they had an interesting point because we started, we were talking about the GTF, you know, there's 550 yard engines waiting to be overhauled. And they said, and then on top of that, there's a big AD out on the V2500. So right. the, uh, my counterparty had two points. He's like, Pratt has run more of a closed supply chain than CFM and GE do. So there's not as many shops currently. Mm -hmm. He said so. And the shops that do the GTF are typically not exclusively, are also the shops that do the V2500. Mm -hmm. He said, but even that's not the whole thing. It's like the sheer number of GTFs and um, V2500s that need to be shopped have clogged up the entire MRO chain. Mm -hmm. So think about it, like the um, MROs are agnostic in terms of dropping engines and, and things like that. It's just where they go to. 
And he said, so, you know, it slowed everything down. So to an extent, it doesn't matter what engine you have. You're going to experience longer turn times because of the, all of the engines that are clogging up um, availability of, of slots now. Yeah, not only that, I mean, it's, you know, it's, which is now affecting, you take the, you know, the, the traders, if you've got CFM, I mean, like, yeah, I look at FTI, who's got a monster portfolio of CFM engines. And if you look at what they're doing, um, you know, if you look at what they're doing compared to, you know, uh, you know, it's just, it's very, people are telling me it's very hard to get a CFM engine now. Uh, and and if you want to go buy one, you know, if you want to go buy one, it's, you know, they're looking at prices. They're like, I, we don't, we don't know how we make money on this. Now it's like, you know, it's like everything. There's a paradigm. Is there a paradigm shift? Is this a temporary, is this a temporary condition? Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very bifurcated market right now. So I, I spoke to uh, two airlines on um, GTF specifically, mm -hmm. and one of them said that they didn't expect something looking like normal until the end of 2025. And the other airline said that's too optimistic from our point of view. We think end of 26. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's I, I think 26 is probably a more accurate figure. And a lot of money, uh, you know, I think Pratt, Raytheon are going to put a lot, yeah, it's going to cost a, both them and airlines just a trash load of money. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, unfortunately, look, you know, we're, you know, you know, and this is the thing is, you know, jet engines are complicated machines, you know, they're complicated machines. And, you know, we've, we've pushed, you know, we've, we've pushed the edge of technology to the point where, yeah, they're, they're going to have a lot of teething paints. And, you know, I know the leap is, you know, the leap 1A, 1B, or they're, they're, they're having some issues too. Don't, that doesn't seem to be as um, prolific as what, uh, what Pratt's going through, but, you know, eventually it'll work itself out. I mean, it always does work itself out, but it's just going to be, you know, it's, it's yeah. going to be time. It's going to be time and money. Yeah, and if you talk to the engine guys, I think certainly privately they would say that they were pushed too hard by the airframe OEMs. Um, you know, compressed time frame and, and push really hard on the, you know, all the focus was on um fuel burn. Mm -hmm. and so this is this is quite different than the previous generation of engines. Like when we switched, if we stick with CFM, when we switched from the 3C1 to the 7B, not only did you get a massive fuel burn improvement you've got a massive on wing time improvement right and that translated into a massive maintenance cost improvement these new engines 100 percent of the focus is on fuel burn and these engines are more expensive to maintain even if they even if they are staying on wing for the um, forecast you know originally forecast duration so how does that play out? I mean, so, you know, you know I, I guess, you know, I guess the maintenance planners are now factoring in, you know, yeah, look, you've, you've heard of CFMs, you know, you know 7B, stay, 5B, 7B, staying on wing 30, 40,000 hours. Yeah. Well, if you take, if you're, if you're using one of those engines in a lower thrust application, mm -hmm. um, back in my days um, at a lessor, you know, we'd get, we got 737-700s off 12-year leases where they hadn't had an engine shop visit. Mm -hmm. And and from an operational parameter point of view, they could they were hitting the retain conditions. It was awesome. remarkable. I mean, just these those engines have been have been fabulous. You know, they I would say if you didn't have an order uh, for new aircraft, given lead times, the challenge, the technology challenge being um, experienced. Um, I would have a hard time making the switch from current tech to, to new tech until everything's settled. Mm -hmm. We used to have a guy in, in when I was at Bombardier uh, on the biz jet side of the house. He always wanted he always wanted to be the first one to order an airplane. <laughs> but his caveat was, I don't want anything before serial number one hundred. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably uh, probably smart too. You know, there's an I, I think. For bigger players, you know, the only 
optic of not already new planes is that you know you're uh, you ticking your ESG box. Yeah, but I, I think that has um, more to do with the with the inability of industry participants to correctly measure what the contribution environmentally or sustainability wise um, is how it should be measured and what the contribution should look like than it does anything else. So how does this we got how does all this play out? I mean, you know, you've got a very chaotic market right now. Who wins? Who's challenged? And what you know, what is you know, what does the new normal start to look like? I mean, yeah, you know, if I'm American Airlines and I'm just flying, you know, seven three seven hundred, you know, you know, you know, I'm flying, you know, dash eight, you know, seven three seven dash eight hundreds with with CFM engines, and I'm Southwest with a with a, with a nice portfolio of those. Am I Am I doing all I can to hang on to that, or am I, you know, am I comfortable continuing with my fleet plan? Well, if uh, history would tell us that if airlines become challenged, capex is the first thing they're going to look at. And if you're a Southwest and you're already LB, you might be at the front of the max line, but you're still not getting them at the pace you want them at. You know, Ryanair, then if you read, has been making um, noises of being a dissatisfied customer with the delays because it's hindering their, their growth. I think you have a real good look at, at keeping um, keeping the current tech fleet. Maybe if you're a Southwest, you know, you just prune like your high cycle planes, you know, once they start hitting that period where they have an increased maintenance burden, those ones I'd say sort of become self-selecting. But I think you you look at capex and and maybe pump the brakes. Um, you're never going to have a better time than with the OEMs at the at the moment because they have, um, you know, they can't they can't um, achieve everything they're supposed to be achieving contractually. So it's an easy time to move orders out to the out to the right. Um, but I think that's what that's what we'll see. I think twenty 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 four could be a. Um, a bit of a mediocre or average year operationally for a lot of airlines. Um, I think the market is too hard on the on the airlines. Like you look at, you know, how much money did Delta make in the third quarter? Like one and a half billion dollars or something like that, and their stock got pounded. <laughs> yeah, I would have thought one and a half billion is quite a lot, but um, you know, Southwest has been pounded. You've had uh, some of the C suite of the you know, within the big three airlines, talking about how the low cost model's broken because it's no longer low cost. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'd buy that from the Southwest angle because they have a very good network. Um, it's not a cherry picked sort of network, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure if JetBlue would slap me for saying this, but I think they aren't really low cost. They're more of a value airline, especially with their mint product and and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I know I, I just think it could be one of these years where you see capex rising to the to the four. Yeah, but but to the low to the the low cost is not low cost. You know, look, I you know, for for grins, I, I fly American pretty much exclusively. It's just it's the easy button for me. But the other day I looked at Spirit. And the, the fact of the matter was Spirit to Florida for Myrtle Beach was no cheaper than Myrtle, you know, than American. Yeah. Well, and the mm-hmm. and the other thing here is that if you look at the demographic of who Spirit flies mm-hmm. around around the country and where they fly to. So if you want to paint it with a real broad brush, it's leisure mm-hmm. travelers flying to, you know, sunny spots. Um, right. And in a higher inflation sort of environment, and of course, inflation as a number can just look high, but of course it attacks different things way differently. You know the price of staples and, and food haven't gone up seven percent. They've gone up fifty percent and a and a hundred percent. So the first thing you're going to give up is your discretionary vacay. Yeah. Right? So I think someone like a spirit is going to be significantly challenged because it's not just the competitiveness of the fare; it's that your own customer base is being attacked by inflation. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. What about the leasing companies? How's the health of the leasing companies holding up? 
you know, air cap, air lease, publicly traded, the, the publicly traded leasing companies. I know there's a lot of private equity in the space too. Yeah. So I always, the, for the big guys and the established guys, you know, the I'd, I don't think there's anyone inside the top 10 that isn't investment grade rated, which has given a very easy access to the 144A unsecured bond market. And um, it's going to take years for that cheap debt to, to roll off. And um, I think one of the sort of sayings about the big leasing companies is that in bad years, they just make less money. It's not, a, it's not the fact that they start losing yeah, money. Exactly, exactly. Now, the smaller guys, I think in a tougher market, I mean, they probably get the tailwind, if you like, of the you know supply chain woes. Um, but I think the real question is, what's your relevance to the market? Mm-hmm. And if you're a small guy and you need to roll over debt, and you know you you did deals at you know low three hundreds a month for, for new aircraft because you know you you had a mismatched borrowing that you know came in at five percent and now you're going to be at eight percent or nine percent and um, that is a very very tough um, scenario to trade through. Mm-hmm. There were companies, if you take a company like Aircastle, they went private again. They've got you know, strong parental support. So I think companies like that are just fine. Mm-hmm. But if you look outside of that, um, historically, guys in the midlife space, the guys who buy in onesies and twosies, um, mm-hmm. that's probably going to be a tough proposition versus the guys that have scaled up in that space so they can – as cliched as it sounds, if you can go when you're trading and offer a fleet solution, it's like, well, buy those 10 planes. You're much better off if, than if you're the guy who's struggling to buy one or two planes because you can't finance them. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I hear you. Are you bullish? What do you what do you what 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 do you what's your what's your view on the industry? We'll wrap it up here. I I I'm probably more bearish than bullish for 24. Uh, I don't think it necessarily knocks a lot of people over like you've seen in other crises. Mm-hmm. But I think you'll see consolidation on the lesser side from, from small portfolios. Um, and I think that I don't see any Chapter 11s for any of the U.S. airlines uh, uh, on the commercial passenger side, but I do see them having some pretty average years. Yeah, yeah I think just the macroeconomics are proving that. Business flyers got to come back. You know the uh, the leisure flyer. It's got to be. You know, look, it cost me fifteen hundred bucks to fly from Carolina to Las Vegas and back. Um, you know, and, and I also I was just looking at at uh, fl- flights to Seattle, and uh, depending on the days I left, uh, coach return was fourteen hundred bucks. Yep. But if I moved my flights one day, they were three hundred. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, it, I, I had the same issue. And, and you know, I just, it was, which, or which is crazy is I live in Wilmington, North Carolina. And from Wilmington to Miami was like a thousand bucks. But if I drove two hours to Raleigh and picked up a direct flight versus instead of going through Charlotte, it was 400. Well, yeah. all right, I'm, I'm, I'm cheap. I'll drive to, I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> I can make a lot of phone calls in two hours. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that is really reflective and indicative for me of, of what we will see in 2024. Um, yeah. That there'll be, I sort of refer to it as a sort of bubble, bubble demand or bubble economics. Um, and that's what it's going to look like for the, for the airlines. How's the advisory work going? It's been pretty busy. Um, there's a, a lot of interest out there still. There's a ton of money on the sidelines. That money's pretty picky. Um, so when we're out there raising debt and equity for for folks, um, you know, when you can, it's not so much the level of interest, I think, Greg, as much as the timing of how investors want to deploy. Um, is is the bigger issue that we like to be in the X space, you know, new aircraft, midlife, or end of life. Yeah, interesting. It's good. Um, no, it's good. I, I'm with you. I think I, I'm with you. I think 2024 is going to be a little bit of a challenging year, and then 2020, you know, 2025 will will start. To, everything will start to track back up. But yeah. You know. So, so one of the interesting things, if you look at the three, three, five, seven, and ten year Ford curves, um, this whole talk about interest rates, you know, ratcheting down quite quickly in 2025 is not what the market thinks. If Ford rates are, yeah, it's a fantasy. 
Yeah. I mean, it looks like they're within a, a 50, 50 bit sort of range. We're going to be in that for quite a while. I think I think it's higher for longer. Anybody who says that the, the anybody who says we're going to see a decrease in rates in the next, you know, two three years, I think it's fantasy land. So yeah, and the other observation on the Ford curve is currently anyway, um, and through to I think it's mid twenty four. There's not much of a spread difference uh, between the tenors. So, you know, normally you you see quite a wide spread, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's not there at the moment. Yep. And that's you know, and that's yeah. The 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 bond market is telling you the reality that yeah, the, the Fed is the the Fed may be saying something different, but the bond market is telling you the truth, and that's that's kind of the way I I always look at things. How do people get a hold of you, Andy? Uh, we're very easy to find on the on the internet on LinkedIn. Um, so anyone searching just has to type in the rather unique name of Split Rock Aviation, and they'll find us. So thank you for coming on. Andy Mansell is a principal with Split Rock Aviation. He's one of the more uh, well-known advisors in the uh, the aircraft leasing sales arena. So thank you for coming back on, Andy. It was a great conversation. Yeah, thanks very much, Greg. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com. Or check us out at www.northstaresg.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.